Are we headed to a financial collapse? So let's have a look at this article on King World News from Egon von Graes. We are headed into final collapse. Ludwig von Mises warned us would take place. So it's interesting here that the uh, UK Prime Minister, Lord Liverpool, uh, who was a Prime Minister from 1812 to 27, said, and I quote, the tendency of an inconvertible paper money is to create fictitious wealth bubbles, which by their bursting produce inconvenience. And then Confucius uh, wrote, and I quote, the noble-minded are calm and steady, little people are forever fussing and fretting. And as we know from history, paper money doesn't just cause an inconvenience, as Lord Liverpool said, but a collapse of the monetary system and the economy involved. In today's decadent and morally bankrupt world, leaders tend to be fussing and fretting little people who frantically create fictitious money and wealth. A combination of weak leaders and fake money is a fitting end to a major economic cycle. It actually couldn't end in any other way. But the world has, of course, not yet seen the end of the current era, which started with private bankers taking control of the U.S. monetary system in 1913. Some of us believe we have a good idea how this will all end, but only future historians and other observers would tell us the exact course of events. The Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises gave us a very likely outcome. Von Mises said, There is no means of avoiding the final collapse of a boom brought about by credit expansion. The alternative is only whether the crisis should come sooner as, a, as the result of a voluntary abandonment of further credit expansion or later as a final and total catastrophe of the currency system involved. Mises' first alternative of a voluntary abandonment is of course totally unacceptable to current governments and central bankers. Don't believe for one moment that Powell or Lagarde would contemplate turning off the tap has kept them and their money-forging friends in power for decades. Yes, they will make gestures like the Fed is now attempting QT, so the balance sheet of the Fed has come down $70 billion since mid-March. And Von Gray says, big deal, and you can see a chart of the Fed's balance sheet right there. He goes on and says that's a 0.7% reduction in three and a half months for a balance sheet that has grown by 240%. 5.3 trillion since the end of August 2019. 2006, the Fed balance sheet was 800 billion and today it is 9 trillion, a mere 11 fold increase. Let's just remind ourselves that the current problems in the world did not start with <clears throat> in early 2020, but with irreparable damage to the financial system, which central banks couldn't conceal beyond August 2019. Everyone knows about the repo market in September 2019. The beginning of the end of this 100 plus year financial era was the great financial crisis, which started in 2006. As I've illustrated in many articles, the cast producing this damage to the financial system changes, but their actions are all the same. After us, the flood is what Louis XV, mistress Madame de Pompadour, Pompadour, told the French king after they lost a critical battle against Prussia in the 18th century. That event was the beginning of the downfall of France. And since 2006, the balance sheets of the major central banks, the Swiss National Bank, Bank of China, Bank of Japan, ECB and Fed, have grown exponentially from under $5 trillion to $36 trillion, a seven-fold increase, which you can see here from this chart. But we must remember that irresponsible debt-creating central banks are only part of the problem. The real money printers are the commercial banks. So if we look at total global debt, it has grown from $100 trillion in 2000 to $300 trillion today. In 2006, not shown, total global debt was $120 trillion. As the graph below shows, which I'll show you in a sec, total global debt, including derivatives and unfunded liabilities, is over $3 quadrillion. When the financial system crashes, these derivatives will prove worthless as counterparties fail and the central banks will print 2 to $3 quadrillion in a futile attempt to save the system. And here's the chart that Von Graes is talking about. Sensible historic 
Comparisons are no longer possible since the debt creation folly of the last 50 years is totally unprecedented in history. 1971, when Nixon closed the gold window, global debt was $1.5 trillion. After 50 years of irresponsible monetary policies, debt has grown 200 times. When we reach a total debt of $3 quadrillion in the next 5 to 10 years, the increase will be 2,000 times since 1971. Now, I can hear some people calling this sensational scaremongering, but I'm sure that these people would have said the same about a 200 times debt expansion since 1971. Also, it is important to understand how exponential moves happen. I explained this in an article from 2017 called Only Contrarians Will Survive. In that article, I illustrated that exponential moves really move exponentially and they are terminal. Now, before we get into this example that he shares here, instead of reading that example, why don't we actually have a look at a video from Dr. Chris Martinson uh, from his crash course. The purpose of this chapter is to help you understand the power of compounding. If something grows over time, such as population, demand for oil, money supply, really anything that steadily increases in size, and you graph it over time, the graph will look like a hockey stick. If something is increasing over time on a percentage basis, it's growing exponentially. Using an example drawing on the magnificent work of Dr. Albert Bartlett, let me illustrate the power of compounding for you. Suppose I had a magic eyedropper and I placed a single drop of water in the middle of your left hand. The magic part is that this drop of water is going to double in size every minute. At first, nothing seems to be happening. But by the end of a minute, that tiny drop is now the size of two tiny drops. After another minute, you now have a little pool of water that is slightly smaller in diameter than a dime sitting in your hand. After six minutes, you have enough water to fill a thimble. Now suppose we take our magic eyedropper to Yankee Stadium and right at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, we place a magic drop way down there on the pitcher's mound. To make this really interesting, suppose that the park is watertight and that I handcuff you to one of the very highest bleacher seats. My question to you is, how long do you have to escape from the handcuffs? When would the stadium be completely filled with water? Would it be days, weeks, months, years? How long would that take? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. The answer is you have until 1250 on that same day to figure out how you're going to get out of those handcuffs. In 50 minutes, our modest little drop of water has completely managed to fill Yankee Stadium. Now let me ask you the more important question. At what time of the day would Yankee Stadium still be 93% empty space and how many of you would realize the seriousness of your predicament? Any guesses? The answer is 1245. If you were sitting idly in your bleacher seat waiting for help to arrive, by the time the field was covered with less than five feet of water, you would only have five minutes left to get free. And that right there illustrates one of the key features of compound growth. The one thing I want you to take away from all this is, with exponential functions, the action really only heats up in the last few moments. You sat in your bleacher seat for 45 minutes and nothing much seemed to be happening. And then in four minutes, bang, the whole place was full. This example was loosely based on a wonderful paper by Dr. Albert Bartlett that clearly and cleanly describes this process of compounding. Dr. Bartlett said, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is the inability to understand the exponential function. And he's absolutely right. With this understanding, you'll begin to understand the urgency I feel. There's simply not a lot of time left once you hop on the vertical portion of a compound graph. Time gets short. This makes compounding the first key concept of the crash course. All right, and back to the article. So for the same reason, debt is likely to grow exponentially in the next five to 10 years as the world experiences hyperinflation. But we must also remember that as commodities such as food and energy, plus many raw materials like precious metals go up exponentially, all the bubble assets, stocks, bonds, and property will implode in real terms. Now, I'll put a link in the description below to this article where you can read it in your own time and also click on all the extra articles in here, such as his concurrent deflation and hyperinflation will ravage the world article. We could, of course, blame Nixon for the debt disaster that the world is in now, but that would be too simple. Governments have throughout history interfered with the laws of nature and the simple law of supply and demand. 
As clueless central bankers and before that governments interfere in the natural ebb and flow or flood waves of the economy, these natural cycle movements become extreme tops and bottoms. These excessive moves lead to speculative asset and credit bubbles followed by hyperinflation and inflation, followed by a deflationary collapse or implosion, just as von Mises said. As I explained above, it is totally natural that the end of major cycles create exponential moves as we have experienced in this century in both debt and assets such as stock and property. But what few people realize is that the frantic money printing and debt creation which has taken place in this century indicate the end of a hundred year old monetary era. The next few years will be like the final five stadium minutes when the debt goes up exponentially by say 14 times before it all collapses. And from the website WTF happened in 1971.com, here's a chart of US national debt from 1900 to 2020. That looks like a hockey graph to me. And also on the same website, when we have a look at the federal debt as a percentage of GDP, uh, look where it's projected to go, and that's from the Office of Management and Budget. So the rest of this article, Fool's Gold, just basically talking about cryptos and how, yeah, everyone talks about Bitcoin being you know, digital gold. Well, well, I don't subscribe to that, but um, yeah. And El Salvador and Fool's Gold, uh, Fool's Gold in Uganda. So that's that, um, yeah, uh, dodgy information uh, that came out that there's 31 million tons of gold ore deposits. Um, that's a false story. And then the article just finishes off uh, talking about how the stock markets around the world are already down 20 to 30%. So we're already in a bear market. What few investors realize at this stage is that the falls we've seen so far are not just a normal correction, but the beginning of a long-term secular bear market with dramatic falls to come. And you guys know I've been talking for a long time about the 73, 74 style recession where asset prices fell 50% in nominal terms or the stock market fell 50% in nominal terms. That's what I see as my base case. So there's still more room to fall, in my opinion. Uh, could we be going into a much bigger kind of 1929, 1930s style? Well, if central banks, you know, really raise rates close to the CPI level, um, then we cannot rule that out. However, that is not my base case. And a shocking chart. China consumer confidence falling off a cliff, heading to all-time lows. Maybe the Chinese are getting sick of being locked down and having authoritarianism imposed on them. And uh, Michael Pettis shared this Financial Times article, debt sell-off intensifies strains for more than a dozen emerging markets. It's pretty shocking to see this scale of collapse in bond prices, said Charlie Robertson, Global Chief Economist at Renaissance Capital, adding that the sell-off is one of the biggest I've seen in 25 years. And that's the thing is, is are we coming to this final, you know, debt bubble collapse? Uh, we know it's a Ponzi scheme. The way credit is created, the way current new currency is created, interest, there's, you know, there's not enough dollars to pay back the debt plus the interest. So we need to continue to create more loans, uh, creating more currency. And ultimately, it's a Ponzi scheme. And we know Ponzi schemes end one way or another, uh, either through the collapse and we have a big deflationary, depressionary bust, or we have that hyperinflationary where they just need to continue to create more and more credit. Yeah, and then there's this, um, which, yeah, Brent Johnson and Kyle Bass has spoken about a lot, and that's the Hong Kong dollar peg failing. So are we seeing that that um, dollar peg fail now? Um, I, I believe there's certain people in the US uh, in positions of authority that want a stronger dollar uh, to punish the world, to, and especially to punish Europe. Uh, yeah, it, it's interesting to see what happens here. I suspect we're going to see uh, some problems in emerging markets 
um, some big problems in emerging markets. And at that point, I think the dollar is going to get very strong. And that's why I've got that, that trade on. Um, but ultimately, it just feels like we are coming to the end of this uh, US dollar being the global reserve currency fiat system. Um, you know, Jim Rogers was saying the other day, he, he feels that we're probably going to something like the IMS SDR, but it's got to be backed by whether it's gold or some sort of commodity. Um, it needs to provide confidence to the market because people are losing confidence all around the world in the current banking system and the current financial system that we've got. And it's not just the uh, debt bomb of China that looks ready to explode that Michael Pettis once again is sharing here. But we've got tanks now guarding banks outside China. This is pretty crazy stuff. You can see here, we've got citizens storming Bank of China over frozen assets. Uh, Bank of China freezes millions of dollars worth of deposits, telling customers they were upgrading their internal systems. And here from the Wall Street Journal, Asian central banks fight an unwinnable battle against the dollar. Uh, central banks in Asia are fighting a losing battle against the meltdown of their currencies. The love of the dollar is strong right now. The best they can hope for is orderly depreciation. I'm not sure if they're going to get that. And this from Zero Hedge. China on the verge of violent debt jubilee as thousands of disgruntled home buyers refuse to pay their mortgage. And here, uh, the Saudi prince, uh, prince says, adopting unrealistic policies to reduce emissions by excluding main source of energy will lead to unprecedented inflation and an increase in energy prices and rising unemployment and a worsening of serious social and security problems. I 100% agree. And we're seeing, whether it's now in Africa, Kenya, uh, South America, right through Asia, we, everyone knows about Sri Lanka, the Netherlands. Wait till, oh, so many other countries as well. I'm leaving so many out. It's actually global now, the amount of people up uh, protesting over food shortages, uh, energy shortages, the cost of basic uh, needs, food, energy, just the basic stuff. Uh, wait till uh, Europe gets to winter. Um, they've got a massive energy problem. And uh, yeah, we're going to see France and Germany and, and you know, major countries in, in Europe uh, go ballistic when they can't heat their homes, uh, when, when they have food shortages and, and you know, things get really bad in these major economies. And this from Jesse Felder, the energy crisis will deepen. In the 1970s, only oil was involved, whereas this crisis encompasses natural gas, coal, and even the nuclear fuel cycle. Why? Because the West went stupid on this new religion. And I'm sorry, I've got to say it how it is, because this is going to have dire consequences. Dire con consequences. Because of the leaders in the West with their stupid... Oh, I can't say. Calm down. Calm down. But back to China. Uh, China asked banks to fund housing projects amid mortgage boycotts. Home buyers stopped paying mortgages on at least 100 projects across 50 cities. So my buddy Tarek says more risk being shifted from the Chinese property sector onto the Chinese banking system, a growing mess of systemic risk. And in this Bloomberg article, dollar doom loop threatens world markets like never before. And look, you guys can pause the video and read that. I'm not going to read it for you now, but I want to show you something. And this is what the dollar doom loop looks like. Stronger dollar equals lower global manufacturing, equals lower commodity prices, equals lower global trade, equals worries about global growth, equals stronger dollar, and so forth, so forth, so forth, until we have problems in emerging markets, um, sovereign debt crises happen, um, you know, Australia could be at risk. Uh, there's a few uh, experts and economists who have looked into Australia's foreign uh, reserve um, our forex reserves, uh, foreign exchange reserves, 
and they doubt we have enough to meet our liabilities. So even countries like Australia could be in trouble if this continues. And so at some point, uh, there's going to have to be, um, you know, some kind of plaza accord or Bretton Woods agreement where they come together because the dollar's just going to get too strong and it's going to cause major problems right across the globe. Also, we got here China uh, dumping U.S. treasuries. Uh, China is now holding uh, U.S. debt uh, below a trillion dollars for the first time since 2010. Uh, Jason Burak says uh, that the Fed will have to buy more and stick them off balance sheet into uh, special purpose vehicles going forward. So here's a chart of China's treasury holdings. And there's clear, clearly a uh, bifurcation happening in the world, uh, which I've spoken about on this channel before. And yeah, I just hope this doesn't lead to uh, armed conflict globally. Um, I guess we'll see. And once again, back to China. Look, China and the US are the largest economy. So you know, they're very important in what happens in those two countries. And uh, China's mortgage boycotts are spreading and could get worse. Uh, nearly 60% of the total assets owned by urban Chinese households were in commercial and residential property. And why is that a big deal? Well, because the Chinese real estate market is the largest asset class in the world. Currently estimated to be valued around $62 trillion dollars. So much larger than the U.S., much larger than the U.S. stock market, fixed income, et cetera, et cetera. So it matters. And here, once again, from my buddy Tarek, hundreds of Chinese property suppliers, including some construction firms, are struggling to survive as they cannot pay off bank loans and bills. And Tarek says time is running out for the Chinese property sector. It either gets major support, some form of bailout, or in time, contagion will spread and elements of it will crumble. And once again from Michael Pettis from Bloomberg, China risks hard landing of housing sector, ex-official warns. An advisor to the State Council says the, that the PBOC should cut interest rates in order to stimulate corporate borrowing demand. They seem to have no idea of what's going on. Corporates aren't investing because there is no demand for their products. Wow. And Jim Vorsight uh, shares Gold Telegraph's uh, tweet where they said Goldman Sachs profits fall 47%, Bank of America falls 32%, JP Morgan has suspended buybacks, banks are starting to feel it. And Jim says, unfortunately, they are likely to make their earnings problems our earnings problems. And uh, with a little crying face, said, just watch the big short again last night. And I'll finish this video with the last word going to Robert Kiyosaki. Warning, inflation may lead to greater depression. Real estate crashing, foreclosures up 700% from last year, layoffs starting, dominoes falling. Is your work or company you work for vital to the economy? Are you necessary? If you are, you will do well. Take care. So what do you guys think? In my opinion, as an Austrian economic analyst, I look at what Ludwig von Mises had to say. And yes, I believe we are somewhere in the end of this uh, current fiat monetary system. The question is, as Mises put it, uh, do we have the deflationary bust due to accepting uh, the debt bubble to pop and to burst? Or do they continue the Ponzi scheme and continue to create more credit and to pump it up and well we die with inflation anyway so do asset prices get smashed or does the currency get smashed that's where we are uh, this thing cannot keep going any longer we're about to we're about to face the pain and unfortunately with the geopolitics uh the, the geopolitical problems that we've got around the world, wars and the rumours of wars and you know, the bifurcation happening and the uprising from the people as inflation hurts, as the stupid energy policies, I keep coming back to that. It makes me so angry. 
because so many people have fallen for it. And, and, and it's taught in universities. It's taught everywhere. I'm the weird guy for, for talking truth. There's pain coming. So anyway, what do you guys think? Love to see your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. Once again, if you like this video, guys, would you do us a favor and hit that like button? Give us that thumbs up. Really do appreciate it. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you all again on another episode of Finance Uncut. And just a reminder, the information provided in this video is for education and entertainment purposes only. Nothing on this channel constitutes as financial advice. The information in this presentation is no substitute for financial advice, and all investors should seek advice from a licensed financial advisor having regard to your own objectives, financial situation, and needs. Thank mm -hmm. you.